Okay, uh, I'm, as Tom mentioned, I'm going to talk in place of uh, Maya Top. She couldn't be here uh, due to uh, some personal reasons. Um, so I'm going to cover the topics that uh, I used to work on uh, when I was in her group uh, some time back. So I'm going to talk about flexible fitting of atomic models in uh, cryo maps, mostly in the intermediate low resolution range and local assessment of models fitted in the uh, in, in cryo maps. Um, just to give an overview on the data, um, cryo data available in EMDB. So there are around 10,000 cryo uh, maps deposited in EMDB um, right now. And uh, the resolution obviously is improving as you all know. And uh, from 2013-14 from onwards, there's, there's been a resolution revolution, and the average map resolution for single particle analysis has uh, dropped steadily. And the best resolution map of maps every year is also improving. The current best resolution is, I think, 1.54 angstrom apoferritin map. Um, one thing to note is that the average resolution is still around 5 angstrom, 5, 5.5 angstrom. So there are a significant portion of um, EM maps which are uh, low resolution or intermediate uh, resolution. Um, as you can also imagine, the uh, number of atomic models associated with EM maps is steadily uh, increasing as well, especially after 2014. The there's been a close to exponential rise in the number of models. So we have uh, data at different resolutions, or we can have a single map with different local resolutions. And you would have to treat different parts of the map differently when you try to model, um, build a model or refine it, or validate the model. So you see different features depending on the resolution of the map and what you try to interpret also the level of details you try to interpret depends on the resolution of the map. For example, up to 3.54 angstroms, you can see at least the bulky uh, side chains and you can have uh, interpret the finer details of, for example, side chain interactions and so on. Beyond four angstroms, you lose that level of detail and you can still identify uh, secondary structures, alpha helices, beta strands, and uh, domain shapes, and so on. So as the uh, resolution decreases, you look at large size uh, shapes, basically. So um, what I wanted to say is that we need different treatments depending on the resolution of the data. And um, we often need different methods um, for fitting, uh, building models or fitting models in maps and different validation tools dealing with different resolutions. So uh, this is a slide from Maya. So this is it's basically to outline different uh, method developments to do with cryo-EM uh, model fitting and validation. Um, so uh, most of these uh, tools are packaged within a Python library called Tempe. So Tempe is a Python toolkit for model fitting and validation. I'm going to cover FlexEM, which is a tool for flexible fitting of models and intermediate low resolution maps, and also give, uh, uh, introduce some functionalities of Tempe, mainly to do with val local validation of models and maps. And some of these tools are already implemented in CCPEM, so you can access uh, those from CCPEM as well. So uh, I'm going to talk about FlexEM. FlexEM is a method for flexible fitting of models. So we need a starting model, which can be a homology model or a crystal structure, which represents a different conformation state. It can be a, uh, it is often a different biological form, for example and you're trying to fit it into a map that represents a different conformation or a different biological state. And you can use Flexium for that. 
So Flexium uses molecular dynamics uh, simulations and a, a cross correlation with the density map, a term for cross correlation with density map is added to the energy calculations. So uh, the idea is to displace atoms <clears throat> to decrease the overall energy of the system. And there is a, 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 so the movement is uh, guided by the density gradient as well. So uh, <clears throat> one important um, aspect here, because Flexium is originally developed to work with, uh, work with low resolution maps. Uh, a concept of rigid body restraints was um, important at that time. Rigid body restraints basically means that uh, you keep a set of atoms which are closer in space together during the uh, fitting process. This basically uh, helps to reduce overfitting or avoid any distortions uh, to the molecule. So um, this slide explains the rigid body restraints used with Flexium. So the idea is to basically divide your model into rigid components of different size. So based on a, a clustering cutoff, you can go from large domains to subdomains and secondary structures and so on. So you basically decompose your uh, structure into smaller compact units. And these units are kept rigid during the fitting process. So there's a method for cal uh, identifying rigid bodies, which is called RibFind. And there's a web server for, um, for this. And recently, the, there has been support for uh, identifying rigid bodies in nucleic acids as well in RibFind. And RibFind is also implemented in CCPEM, so if you have CCPEM, there is a task called RibFind, which you can use to calculate these rigid bodies, which is, and you can visualize this uh, rigid bodies in Chimera, and also look at the residue composition of each rigid bodies. So um, ideally, Flexium uh, works best if you uh, use it in a hierarchical way. So to induce large body motions. We start with larger rigid bodies, and then we kind of hierarchically go uh, to smaller and smaller rigid bodies uh, in different stages of flexium. So um, you can use refine for that with different cluster cutoffs, and you can uh, get different sized rigid bodies. And at each stage, you can start with larger domains, you uh, do a flexium run, follow it with the finer uh, rigid body refinement. This helps to uh, kind of, uh, so if you look at the movie, yeah. it helps to bring in this large body movements initially and then that's a fine secondary structure fitting afterwards. Flexium is also implemented in CCPEM, so there's an interface for Flexium in CCPEM. You need a, a model and map as inputs, and rigid bodies can be uh, calculated from RibFind automatically, or you can mention your own rigid bodies in a text file. And basically, you get some statistics on the improvement in the fitting scores. So this is a global cross-correlation score at each step of uh, Lexium run. And you can also visualize the improvement in fitting in Chimera with the models from different iterations of Lexium. Um, I'm going to move on to Tempe, which is a Python toolkit uh, for model uh, fitting and validation. And Tempe can be accessed from the link here. So this is part of uh, Maya Top's uh, group. And there are different functionalities in Tempe. So it's basically a set of Python routines which does different uh, functions. So there are uh, routines for doing map processing, map or model processing. There are, there's a method for multi-component fitting, which is uh, simultaneous fitting of different components, different uh, models in a map, which is called Gamma Tempe. 
and there are a uh, set of routines for calculating scores of models against maps. And you can get outputs in different forms, such plots or uh, PDB files code, which can be colored in Chimera and so on. So I'm going to talk about a few of them uh, now. So uh, one method in Tempe, uh, which helps to calculate the local fitness score of a model uh, is the uh, smock score, which is a segment-based Manders overlap coefficient. So it, it's basically an overlap coefficient, which tells you uh, how good the fit of a model locally um, along the sequence, for example. So here is a plot of the score along the sequence, and this is, these are the values of the score. And so here I've manually introduced an um, error in the side chain fit for example, so it's an obvious case, a tryptophan misfitted in, um, in the density. And you can identify uh, such misfits with, this, with such uh, local assessment methods. So again, you can use it to um, identify these segments which are badly fitted. So these can be either uh, genuine errors or areas with less information. So here, for example, some of the disordered loops are um, badly scored uh, because there's no or less information available for the uh, for evaluating fit with respect in relation to the rest of the model. <coughs> so SMOC is also implemented in CCPEM. So there's a task called Tempe Local Score, which you can use to. Uh, so you need a uh, model or a set of models which you can compare against and a map, and you get plots of um, scores along the sequence, and you can compare multiple models, which can be from different stages of refinement. <coughs> so uh, I'll move on to another um, tool uh, available in Tempe and also in CCPM. It's a method to calculate uh, difference maps. So. Um, so this originally started when we were uh, dealing with the project uh, to compare and classify uh, volumes in EMDB. And we were looking at methods for alignment and also for, to calculate differences between different uh, EM maps. So the idea is that given two maps at uh, different uh, resolutions, for example, or a map and a model, can we identify at least the significant uh, differences? So, um, uh, there is a method in Chimera, for example, which does a real space uh, difference calculation of two maps, but it uh, doesn't include any scaling uh, of the map densities. So often the map density distributions are um, in different scales and um, we need to scale them to an appropriate uh, or an equivalent uh, level before calculating the differences. So what is done here is to do an amplitude uh, matching, so which is basically scaling the amplitude uh, based on the resolution dependent fallout of the two maps. So each map is scaled to an average uh, from the two maps. A and there is also an option for local scaling. So when you do a global scaling, um, if your map has a non-uniform local resolution, it doesn't essentially uh, scale parts of the map, the local regions of the map uh, optimally. So to account for the effect of local resolution, you can use the local scaling option. So essentially the power spectra of the uh, maps are used to scale uh, the densities and the difference is then calculated in real space. So here are uh, two examples of one uh, map versus map comparison. So uh, a map of a kinesin bound to uh, ATP uh, analog, ATP uh, aluminum fluoride, and another map which is a non-ligand in state. So if you calculate the difference between the two, we hope to see uh, the major conformational changes plus the ligand binding site as a difference. So here, uh, if you look at the difference, so uh, the gray density is the difference map, and it identifies the uh, ligand binding site plus 
some parts of the uh, kinexin are stabilized upon um, complexation with the ligand. So you also identify such uh, conformational differences um, by calculating the difference. We can also uh, use it to compare model against map. So you can essentially use it as a method to validate uh, model fits and map. So this is done classically in crystallography to calculate difference maps and identify um, and fix models based on the differences. So we can do, the, do similar things for EM as well. And here, these errors are kind of uh, manually introduced and some of them are really subtle uh, ch changes in side chain confirmation. Some are quite obvious uh, differences and the uh, difference map calculation identifies these uh, differences. Um, this is another example of a case of uh, different family of kinesin. So uh, this inhibitor is known to block the activity of kinesin. And we were interested in uh, studying the mechanism of action of this uh, inhibitor. And the uh, binding site was not known, plus the mechanism of uh, action was not known. So we basically used different maps as a guide to identify the ligand binding site, which is roughly there. So it sits nicely in a pocket between two uh, subdomains of uh, kinesin. And so when you calculate different maps, you end up in, uh, especially at low resolution, so in, you end up in, a lots, of, uh, in lots of differences. Uh, which are, and it's hard, often hard to identify the right uh, blob which points to the ligand binding site. So here we uh, used, uh, we took help of different computational tools to identify pockets and uh, basically we calculated energetics of binding the ligand at different, uh, different pockets in the, uh, on the surface of kinesin. And we also had some information from a related kinesin family that another set of uh, inhibitors bind to the same pocket and block the activity of kinesin in an in a allosteric fashion. So the differences you see here is basically coming from confirmational change in the ATP binding site. So it basically blocks the activity of kinesin uh, through binding of ATP. So uh, the difference maps was mainly used, uh, quite useful to, uh, as a guide to identify the ligand binding site. And the binding site that we uh, kind of uh, pinned down in the end is lined up with residues specific for the family of kindness and that binds the same bit. So that was uh, quite encouraging. Um, I will move on to model validation. So um, at the moment we are uh, developing an interface for atomic model validation in CCTEM, uh, which involves a combination of different tools, uh, which looks at different aspects of the model for, uh, in terms of validation. So uh, when we are uh, in cryoEM, we are dealing with data at different resolutions. So we are looking at, uh, so if we are working with models fitted on maps beyond five angstroms, for example, um, it's important to look at um, the quality of the secondary structures, for example, or the fit of secondary structures against the map uh, density and so on. So there are different aspects of the model that we need to look at depending on the resolution of the map. At the moment, the interface has uh, the tools listed here. So mole probability <laughs> is, uh, so we use, we link, uh, we access mole probability through CCP4. So you need, to you need to have CCP4 installed to uh, use small probability in CCDM. There's CABLAM, which is a related method, but it looks at the quality of backbone of uh, atomic models. There's a SMOC score that I mentioned, which looks at the fit against data, the local fit against data. Uh, this REFMAC for calculating model map FSCs and FSC average. And uh, this uh, JPRED, which is a secondary structure prediction tool. So it predicts secondary structures from sequence. And uh, basically you can use the high confidence predictions as a guide to fix issues in the model. So 
So the interface gives you different results. So you have the standard statistics from all probability and CABLAM. You have the model map FSCs. So you can also input half maps, for example, and do something similar to the half map validation. So uh, to estimate any overfitting uh, in the model. So you can input multiple maps and compare the model fit against map. And uh, there's FSC average, which is single value calculated using the model map FSC curves. And you can calculate this for different model map combinations. So the interface basically gives you a list of um, outliers. So we heard yesterday that some outliers can be genuine and functionally relevant. So um, we might need to keep some outliers if we have um, uh, if we have evidence to believe that they are functionally important and thus data supporting the outlier uh, fit. Um, so. It, in many of the cryoEM models, you will end up with a long list of outliers, which can be a bit overwhelming. So what we did here is to cluster the outliers spatially. So we basically group them by uh, vicinity in space. Um, and so the, these clusters basically point to major problems in your models. And you often have to fix these major issues before uh, going to the individual problems. So uh, as in CCP4, um, there is an interface to code as well with, uh, with a list of outliers calculated from uh, different uh, tools in CCPM. And you can go through each of them and try to fix it with different uh, tools in code. Code also has diff uh, many useful tools for model validation. So you can use them as a guide when you do the fixing. Uh, one thing that we need to do is to kind of automatically link it, uh, link the uh, estimates of validation as you do the fixing uh, in code. This has not been done uh, so far. So um, I mentioned that um, in uh, uh, the cryo data comes in uh, different local resolutions or uh, even different local resolution, uh, different global resolutions. And we need to diff, um, look at different aspects of the model when you uh, think about model validation. So there is a component of fit to data. So we need to calculate those global statistics and the local fit to uh, map measures. We need to look at the standard stereochemistry and the geometry of the model. There are different set of tools for that, uh, which we can think of. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many other tools as well. We can, uh, we need to estimate the quality of secondary structures, for example. The tertiary structure refers to interaction and the packing of each atomic acid in, um, uh, in a structural environment. So we can, uh, there are different tools which we can use uh, for that. Um, we need to look at the quaternary structure as well, which is basically looking at the quality of inter interactions or the interface between different proteins. There are uh, methods for cross-validation which have been uh, introduced in the EM uh, field. There's the half map uh, validation which is quite popular and is part of RefMac. Uh, there's another method which is part of a tool called Direx which looks at, uh, uh, which keeps different uh, resolution cell shells separate for uh, validation. Something more similar to the R3 which we use in crystallography. Uh, there are tools in Tempe as well, which does some sort, uh, kind of cross-validation. And of course, we need uh, support from other experiments, for example, mutations or cro cross-links and so on, if we uh, are uh, really dealing with low-resolution data. So uh, I also wanted to mention some initiatives towards uh, EM validation. So there is... Uh, Welcome Trust UK Validation Initiative, which is which uh, runs across six different sites in the UK. So it's been running for two years now, and there has already been different tools developed across different sites towards map and model validation for EM. 
Another um, important thing to mention is the validation challenges run as part of EMDB. So there's been three uh, different challenge challenges, at least the model challenge this year, and the model and map challenge in 2016. So this has been really useful, especially for uh, method developers, for example. So this gives a platform to compare different methods. So the, there are different targets in, uh, in these challenges, which runs across different, uh, across different resolution ranges. And you can use your own method to uh, evaluate the performance. And there are, there are different scores, which are used to uh, evaluate these methods um, of, uh, in terms of the quality of the model and the model fit and density, for example. It also gives a, a good data set for benchmarking, for example. So these, the models are submitted by developers of different methods. So it get, gives you a data set of models for a specific target. And you can look at errors um, in different models in terms of validation and so on. Um, that's all I wanted to cover. And I would like to acknowledge Maya. So um, she couldn't be here, as I, as I mentioned. And I, uh, hopefully I covered different uh, parts of the talk that she wanted to. And uh, TOPS group at Burbeck, uh, the data on kinesin that I showed are from Carolyn Moore's lab. And um, the difference map method and the shape matching method that we worked on was in collaboration with EBI and also the validation tools are developed in collaboration with um, EMDB. I would also like to thank the CCPM team, Martin, Tom, and Colin um, for different implementation and different uh, parts of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Agnum. <clears throat> so we have time for a couple of questions. <clears throat> Maybe I can <coughs> start with one. So would you like to comment Agam, about uh, how you think the, the trends in EM resolution are going to develop in the coming years, particularly with regard to the, the rise of tomography? Yes, so as I <coughs> mentioned in the first slide, so uh, there has, I mean, there's still a significant portion of EM uh, data, which is kind of at uh, intermediate low resolution. And uh, the, the best maps from subtomogram averaging, for example, are around three, 3.5 angstroms. So there is uh, quite a bit of data beyond the 3.5 angstrom limit. Um, and the, I mean, there's going to be quite a bit of uh, technological developments in uh, tomography in the coming years, for example, which will bring the uh, data from tomograms to sub nanometer resolution range, hopefully. So you will still have a uh, lot of data coming from EM and tomography at this kind of intermediate resolutions, but things become a bit difficult in terms of model fitting and validation. So any questions from the, from the floor? So, um, Agna, when you fit your atomistic structures into yep. the cryo-EM maps yep. with the molecular force fields, yep. do you ever then compare the energies of the two different conformations to work out why that conformational change has occurred? Is that something that would be useful to do? Yes, yeah, I think this is something interesting. So we don't do this at the moment. So the energy is also driven by the fit to density. Uh, so we basically calculate um, um, the decrease in energy as you go from uh, through the MD simulation. And it, yes, it is useful. It will be useful to look at the energy uh, coming from the model stability by itself in different conformations. Yeah, yeah it's a good point. Anybody else? So 
in order that we make sure that we, we meet our date with coffee later. Let's thank Agnol once again. Yeah.